Good evening and uh, welcome to this event uh, hosted by the BC Greens uh, this evening uh, where I'm Adam Olson, I'm the MLA for Science North in the Islands and uh, one half of the BC Green Caucus. And uh, tonight uh, I'll be joined by my two siblings. It's gonna be a Olson family affair. Uh, you'll see uh, Heather's with me already. Joni um, is actually on her way, we're hoping. Um, oh, she's just calling me now. Uh, just one second. This is live. Hello. Okay, I'll get him to forward it to you again. That's our Okay, so live live TV folks or live uh, meeting folks. Uh, my sister Joni uh, Olson has just come in from her Sartlip Council meeting and uh, she will be joining us in a second. I just made sure that she had the link. Welcome, Heather. I think you should shout out mom. I see she's on here too. So it's our oh, is she? Our mother, Sylvia Olson, is here. Real Olson. Good. Almost the whole family. I think Emily might be showing up. She was asking me if there's a link. Thank you all for for joining us this evening. Uh, this is a, a really nice opportunity for us to talk about some of the um, current events, some events that are maybe not so current uh, in Canadian history, but just talk about Indigenous relations and um, the various aspects that I and my sisters, um, Joni and Heather, the roles that we play uh, in the various governance structures that have been set up uh, here in British Columbia. And uh, we're just waiting a couple more minutes here as we still see people starting to filter in. Joni will be joining us in just a couple of minutes. If she can uh, get the link working. I hope everybody is uh, enjoying the heat. I, can you say enjoying the heat? I, I hope everybody is doing as well as they can uh, to suffer through the really extreme uh, heat temperatures. And I'd, I'd say, you know, for an event being hosted by the BC Greens and the conversations that uh, Sonia and I were having today with respect to climate change and the impacts of heat. Heather, this must be something that is uh, on top of your mind as a healthcare professional, the impact of heat on people and certainly nothing that we've seen like this before. And here comes Joni. All right, as soon as Joni can get her camera on here, we will get started. There we are. Good evening, Joni. Welcome, Heather. My name is, uh, we'll, get this, uh, we'll get this evening going. The, uh, it's going to be a, a fairly um, relaxed conversational uh, type evening uh, between uh, my two wonderful and beautiful sisters, Heather and Joni. Uh, to start, uh, we'll start by just introducing ourselves and the, our work and, and where we work and the, the work that we do. And then uh, you'll see that the um, question and answer area is open for you, uh, for all of the participants. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And, uh, you know, uh, Joni and Heather and I could talk probably for hours. In fact, we do talk for hours about governance and the various uh, structures that we work within. Uh, however, I think that this is a good opportunity for you to ask questions and for us to provide any kind of response that we can come up with to your questions, uh, because this is a unique opportunity. And as you'll see, uh, the three of us work very much alongside each other, but also in very different aspects of governance and, and uh, just institutional and, and bureaucratic um, institutions in our, in our province. And so for, for you to have, if you have any questions, uh, about the work that we do and about our perspectives on that, then this is a good opportunity for you to ask and for us to uh, to pro provide the best response we can um, in that in that format. So the evening the evening uh, is largely framed around uh, the uh, findings at the Kamloops uh, Indian Residential School, and as I stated in the 
in my ministerial uh, response uh, to the ministerial statement uh, delivered by John Horgan, this is certainly nothing new for the three of us or for our family or for indigenous people across this country. The stories of, of residential schools and the Indian Act policy, uh, the deliberate uh, policy to um, that has been delivered by the governments of Canada and the Crown provincial governments across the province, across the country to gain control of land and resources uh, and to control all aspects of Indigenous people's lives uh, is something that we've lived in as, as the three of us lived on reserve, born and raised on reserve, and, and we have that experience. So tonight we're going to have a conversation about reconciliation, and let's start with in, some introductions. I'll start with you, Joni. Perhaps you can provide uh, a little outline as to who you are and uh, your education and as well uh, where you're working these days. Oh, thanks, Adam. <clears throat> So my name is Joni Olson and I am Adam's sister. Um, just joking, um, but I am, but that's uh, how I often uh, am known. Um, I am an elected counsel for the Sartlip First Nation. I have, um, am just in the last year of my seventh term. Um, and in the work that I've done for Sartlip First Nation, I've uh, mostly uh, focused on things like um, uh, lands, rights, and title, um, fisheries, so the, really the work with the federal and the provincial governments, and um, probably about um, seven years into uh, being an elected counselor, I decided that um, I probably should go back to school because I often got put on, at tables where we were negotiating with federal governments and often looked across the table and was like, they're probably looking at me like I know nothing and and I need to actually have something behind my name rather than just Adam's sister. And so I uh, went forward and uh, uh, got a, a degree from the University of Victoria in political science. And I have a double minor in indigenous studies and environmental studies. And um, I went into it thinking that I would go into law and I really wanted to do the indigenous law program at uh, the University of Victoria. Um, this is the first year uh, in which um, they've offered that um, course, um, but realized that, um, you know, our father had gone through a court case, brought it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, won the court case, and the um, judicial body turned around and said to him, now you must go back to British Columbia and implement this, this court case. And in my last semester at university, um, I had um, some spare uh, classes that I could just choose whatever I wanted to take. I had finished all um, sort of electives that I had interest in and was looking around and ended up taking a public admin class because I was like to stay really focused on, um, you know, classes that could help me understand the system in which we're working and felt like public admin would be a really important one. And um, in the first, one of the first assignments, I got a chance to write a briefing note and I was like, <sighs> I am not becoming a lawyer. I need to change policy through um, writing uh, writing policy because there actually isn't a lot of indigenous people um, writing um, indigenous uh, policy. So I very quickly did a, a turnaround and applied for a master's degree in public admin and am now halfway through um, a terrible summer semester, but halfway through um, um, public administer, uh, administration master's degree from the University of Victoria. And um, for my line of work, um, so not school, not council, I am a full-time employee with the Husanich Leadership Council. And it's an organization that um, advocates politically for the Tsaikam, Sayout, and Sartlet First Nations um, combined. And I am a policy negotiations analyst. And I do a lot of negotiations with the federal, uh, provincial, and municipal tables, actually, um, now that they're all reviewing their official community plan and moving forward there, I uh, worked uh, with the CRD file. So um, all levels of government um, uh, looking at how to change that internal structure through um, policy development in, um, that is conscious of uh, in indigenous people and uh, belief systems um, and rights and uh, so on. So uh, hopefully I can answer questions tonight. I just came from a council meeting. That's why I was a couple minutes late. And um, 
was thinking that I might be able to sit in Adam's cool office with him, but uh, I'm gonna sweat it out here today with you. Nice to meet you all, thanks. Thank you, Joni. And uh, so I guess the Oxanage Leadership Council for for those who might not know, it's it's like a uh, the regional government equivalent. So it's like the uh, the capital regional district equivalent for the the Sandwich Nations and um, the Sarkla Council is the local government equivalent. Uh, and so you're very well uh, suited to be talking about the the, the perspectives of um, the relationships that the regional and the individual nations have with uh, other orders of government. Okay, Heather, and congratulations on getting through your summer session this summer, by the way, Jones, um, <laughs> with all the other stuff that you're doing. And by the way, the other thing that I would just point out, seventh term, and this is something that we can talk about in terms of reconciliation, they're two-year terms. So seventh term in, in, terms of, in terms of council would have you, uh, or municipal council would have you elected for 28 years, but you're elected for 14 years, basically one year uh, longer than I was, have been in governance. Okay, over to uh, Heather, and uh, perhaps you can provide a little bit of background as to where you work and what you're doing uh, and uh, what you're trained in. Heather? Sure. Uh, my name's Heather Hastings, um, but I am the third Olson. So I am uh, Adam's my brother is like how I would like to say that. Um, and uh, I am a registered nurse, um, but more re and I've worked for Startlip uh, since 2010 as their community health nurse. And then like Joni went back to school when I realized that my job was much more than just nursing and it became um, larger than I felt like I had the capacity to do. And so I went back to school and um, have a master's in leadership from Royal Roads with a health specialization. Um, and the focus of my study during that program was um, equitable access to primary care for um, First Nations people. And really what came out of that was a really solid understanding of the discrimination and racism and systemic racism that actually um, impact the health outcomes of Indigenous people. And went back to school uh, and I'm in my going into my second year of the doctoral program of doctoral social sciences at Royal Roads. Um, and I am focused on researching systemic racism in the healthcare system. So um, that's that's my education um and like i said so i was working in startlip as the uh, as the registered nurse uh and then over the last five years or so have been the health director there and um currently seconded working for the ministry of health uh on the implementation of the recommendations of the in plain sight report uh my title is the director of knowledge and practice so that's just gonna say that. Uh, I don't get to use it very often. So <laughs> I have I have my siblings in the room. So I'm going to. Um, and so really that that's been a lot of it's been an awesome work. It's, it's a provincial team put together people with um, certain expertise, whether or not it's in, in healthcare. Um, and so mine is more like community based healthcare on the ground. Um, at the point of care uh, experience. And then it's indigenous and non-indigenous people provincially who are working on um, how we can action these items. So really working with um, indigenous partners and um, organizations, as well as um, the, ministry, the ministry itself and the provincial uh, health authorities. So working through those uh, 24 recommendations um, that work to, um, address systemic racism. So that's really where, um, although it was really apparent to me um, after doing my master's, uh, what the what the impacts of the healthcare system were on Indigenous people, when the In Plain Sight report, when we when we had the, um, the report from Adrian Dix mentioning that there was reports of racism in the healthcare system, similar to what we're hearing with residential schools, again, it's not a story that Indigenous people aren't familiar with, we're, we're aware of that. And so now, now we were doing that investigation into the healthcare system and, and um, we kept saying racism is systemic. 
and wondering what that looks like and what that actually means so that we can uncover it, determine it, define it, and also see where it's silent. Like, where aren't we seeing it, but, it, but we're um, experiencing it. So anyways, that's, that's my education and my, uh, my, my work all wrapped into the same thing right now. Thank you, Heather. And uh, there, there was a, a long conversation when you got that job uh, with that job title about just what kind of responses you'd get from your other siblings being able to come in and be the director of knowledge. So I guess the only way for you to actually improve your position would be to become the director or the superintendent of wisdom or something like that. You know, it's maybe the only escalation. So um, I don't have uh, the, I'm, I'm not going to be Dr. Olson and I won't have an MA. I won't be a, I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a street kid, basically, not really. Uh, but I don't have the, uh, the the great education that that you two have been working on. I uh, worked. I went to Camosun College and went into the Applied Communication program. This was about 18 years ago, 16, 18 years ago now, and was going to go get a job in the media. And I was going to be the play-by-play -play commentator for hockey because you know there's nothing more important than play-by-play -play commentation of hockey games. And both my sisters know that I can talk quite a bit, quite well. So seemed like a good place for me to go and, and where I, my, my talking would be appreciated. Little did I know that another place that you can talk is in politics. And so in 2008, I, uh, after working with the Victoria Salmon Kings and with the University of Victoria and with Aboriginal Sports and Recreation Association of BC, I got elected into local government. I got elected at the District of Central Saanich. And it was one year after Joni got, but both Joni and I were nominated actually in 2007 and uh, our boy Silas was was born actually the day of the election, and so I I stepped down from and removed my name from the list that the year of 2007, and then the following year municipal council elections were happening in Central Saanich and across the province, and decided that I would run for uh, run for municipal council, and it was a very eye opening experience for someone who was born and raised uh, on an Indian reserve in this in this country and in this province. Uh, to step across the road and and to be elected into local government because I did not have the context the the either the education background or the lived experience of zoning bylaws of of official community plans of of all of the kind of technical aspects of governance I was able to get elected I think largely because we had very very long standing relationships with many families. Uh, in our in our municipality, but it was also because I was able to do kind of retail side of politics fairly well. And so, once I got elected, though, it was a big big world that opened up to me to to learn how to work through a bylaw process, how to work through um, zoning and development, which is largely what municipalities are about. They're about the land use side of of governance. I was in Central Saanich Council for. Um, five years. I got elected in 08, got re-elected in 2011 uh, before I stepped away and, and decided to run uh, for the BC Greens uh, in the 2013 election. I was very close to being elected, uh, fell short, became the interim leader of the BC Greens for a period of about three years uh, and then ran again in 2017. And, and I think uh, and most people who are on the call this, more, this afternoon or this evening uh, will be familiar with uh, the story from there as I've been part of the BC Green Caucus since 2017. And now I work very closely with Sonia Fersino uh, in the legislature doing the work of, of an MLA in Saanich North in the islands. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, if I'm going to put some context around reconciliation, when I got elected in central Saanich, there'd never been anybody that had been elected from either Sartla for sale, one of the two First Nations within uh, the, within the boundaries of Central Saanich. There was never a conversation about reconciliation. There was never a conversation even about a relationship with the two First Nations in the municipality. It was a, it was a very cold place uh, when I first got elected. And when we had those first uh, community to community forum meetings and I was sitting at one part of the table and Joni was sitting at another part of the table, there was just this tension that, that existed there between the two communities. And here we are, brother and sister, kind of sharing in the tension. 
I'm sure Joni had tension on on her role and and the relationship that she had with me and the relationship that the community had with Central Saanich, just as I had the tension uh, with uh, the district and my council colleagues. And over the years, I'd say that the that there has been an evolution uh, in the relationship at the municipal level. I would say it's not perfect, but I think Joni's probably better positioned to be able to provide that perspective. In 2012, at the very end, December of 2012, November, December of 2012, Idle No More happened or began. And there was uh, fairly uh, large steps forward, I think, for all of Canadian society and Canadian culture when it came to getting to know the Indigenous communities and the Indigenous people around you. And so I think that um, this was really the first step uh, our mom's emailing us, by the way, saying, get to the questions, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> anyway, um, she, uh, so I think when, you, when, when we're taking a look at, uh, at the context of the evolution that's been happening in Canadian society, I really go look back to I don't know more and that, that winter of 2012, 2013, just as I was getting prepared for the 2013 provincial election. Uh, and then of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's uh, Inquiry both have laid out hundreds, as it turns out, of recommendations for the provincial and federal governments to, um, to do a much better job of reconciliation than they have. And we're now in 2021 with the recent um, findings that have been uncovered, the preliminary findings that have been uncovered in Kamloops and in Saskatchewan with the expectation that these are going to continue, um, these announcements will continue at all of the residential schools across the country. And certainly we've heard from our family members, the stories of Cooper Island Residential School where uh, our family and extended families, our grandparents and our great aunties and uncles uh, went to school as well as the day school uh, students. So um, I just wanted to, I think I'm gonna, I'm going to get to the questions here, but I just want to ground the conversation uh, with respect to reconciliation and just the dictionary definitions of reconciliation. The first one is the restoration of friendly relations and the action. And the second one is the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. And so just in the very basis of reconciliation, just from the dictionary definition of reconciliation, I think that we can agree that these are very important steps that we'd be taking together, especially with the provincial government. As Joni mentioned, our father uh, uh, fought a case all the way to the Supreme Court. But maybe just quickly, before I go to the questions, I'm gonna go sort it out while you're talking, but maybe you can provide, I'll start with you, Joni, you can provide some context around what reconciliation means to you and the position that you're in and the work that you do. Oh, that's so easy. <laughs> Um, I actually liked your definition number two on um, uh, making our views compatible with each other um, uh, because it's not yeah, you can make something compatible that's not uh, always perfect but it's but it's actually really difficult to get there. Um, you know I was what the first thing that came to my mind was uh, we were in a meeting with uh, um, the Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resources, like FLINROD or what, like that huge acronym, a few, um, like about a month ago, actually, it's really recent. And they're looking at uh, reconciliation uh, with First Nations and the, and the economy within their ministry. And this is the first time they've really like um, done this differently where they are discussing, it's not consultation, but they're just discussing with First Nations um, you know what that might look like. What what could they change within this ministry in order to really look at reconciliation? And you know, it really went. Uh, at First Nations really go hard after land, and I think that there's especially here in BC a really uh, um, uh, elephant in the room, and it's the Indian land question. And so the the tables that I sit at, the governments are really grappling with um, the fact that they are on the land, that they make, uh, their economy is on the land, that they have made billions of dollars off of land that is unsettled land. 
And what it really came down to, I think in the end was there was a chief from the interior of BC and the, the minister actually said, if you had like closing statements, everybody went around in a circle. If you had one thing that you wished, one, one wish came true, what would it be? And the chief stood up and he waved his magic wand and he said, you to have courage. And that's what he said, because it actually takes courage to make change and systematic change. And it's not, it's not for the faint of heart and it's not easy work. And uh, you, you don't become everybody's favorite. And you actually have to go against uh, a system that was built to, to hold you back and that takes courage. And I think he was a little bit taken back at that response, but we all definitely agreed because the things that we were putting on his table were not gonna be easily accepted um, by the province of British Columbia and by, let's be honest, a lot of citizens also. Um, but uh, I think that the bottom line is, is trust. I think that non-Indigenous people need to trust that Indigenous people have the ability to make good decisions on land on our own health, on um, our own governance systems. And um, I don't think that that trust is there. There's a really big uh, uh, patriarchal uh, place in, in our system that, uh, you know, the federal government will say to us, you know, oh, we're talking reconciliation. Let's first implement you a, a self-government agreement. And hey, we've got some templates you can use. Um, and that to, to us, that's, that's definitely not the solution. We're working within a template right now um, that we didn't create and it, and it doesn't work. And so I think that there needs to be some trust uh, built back uh, on both ways uh, within reconciliation and that takes time. I think we all know that trust, building trust takes time and uh, we all get very impatient. First Nations people like things to take time. Uh, it's built into our culture um, you know, meetings can take 18 hours and that just is something that you have to sit through and that's part of our teachings. So I think that, um, I think that building trust and having courage uh, to make that change, I think for me is uh, re what reconciliation looks like. Thanks. Awesome. Heather? Yeah. Um, so based on what I, what I'm doing in my job around the In Plain Sight report. Um, I feel like, and what I'm doing in my school, I feel like I'm maybe still stuck in the truth phase of the truth and reconciliation. Like I'm still trying to uncover exactly what it is that we are reconciling. And we're still like, these are, these are it's not, it's not history. Like it's still our present. And so I'm, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm a bit when I think about truth and reconciliation, I, I, I I'm, I'm in the truth while also moving forward to how do we reconcile it. And I honestly think that the, the truth, um, the In Plain Sight report is an act of reconciliation. Like those 24 recommendations really do um, encompass what it would mean to um, like put reconciliation to action within the healthcare system. But I, I have, there's a quote by Murray Sinclair, Senator Murray Sinclair. Um, sorry, my screen just came up. I was trying to do something. And he says, I want people to understand that even those who support doing away with racism, those who believe racism is bad, are, them, are themselves caught up in a system that almost forces them to continue to adhere to policies and beliefs that they do not understand. It comes from a history of racism and until we address that and learn from it, we can't begin to fix it. So I, I feel like that's really like, to Joni's point around like those policies, like how do we, like change those systems that are actually that we're all caught up in in order to move to reconciliation and so um i really feel like reconciliation might be like they're they're acts and they're always acts and i don't know that there will ever be an uh a destiny like there's no destination to that i think like it's about that reestablishing trust and relationship um, and part of that is sitting in the uncomfort and the, dis the discomfort of learning Mm. And um, so I think that that's where we are right now. And I'll quote mom, because she's going to want us to get to the questions. You know, we're growing up and part of that is learning. So, that's right. yeah. I was on a, I was on a, a panel with Seth Klein, a uh, well-known climate activist. And, and um, 
one of the things that he talked about was, you know, we can have all the good plans in the world, but if we don't have the institutions that that are are tasked and mandated and and created in the right way to implement the plan, you're not going to get it. And currently, you know, I think the institutions that we're a part of um, are constructs of these crown governments. The provincial government is very much that. Uh, the band council is very much a construct set out in the Indian Act. Um, and even the health and the healthcare system is a construct that we've created. And we've created this situation. And the only way for us to be able to work it out, Heather, you talked about changing the system. Joni, you talked about having courage to change. Everybody that we're talking to right now is talking about new institutions that set up. And one of the things that Murray Rankin, the new Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, has passed with in his in the action plan is to create a new institution across government to ensure that these recommendations are being implemented. All right, um, let's go to let's go to the questions. A quick question to you, Joni, directly to you from Eric. Did the education that you're getting accomplish the goals that you're trying to achieve? You know what? They def it, it definitely is helping me accomplish the goals that I want to achieve, but I, I have to tell you something. Um, it doesn't give you any cred within our community. Um, they, they, they don't really, uh, to be honest, uh, people across the table uh, care whether I have an education or not. And, um, uh, you know, I, I figured when I went into political science that I needed to learn about the system in order to take it out. You know, you need to know something in order to find its weakness and target where you want to take it out. So that was my whole strategy. Um, and uh, you know, it's a it's a beast of a system, and uh, you know, there's uh, so m much complexity around jurisdictional uh, issues with uh, federal, provincial, municipal, CRD, and First Nations. That you know, it's a constant learning process. But I can say that um, my education is is definitely a big help there. And I can tell you the the constructs of of not so I can give you the experience of not having a a, a poli sci degree or uh, the degrees in this and that is that I have to work harder to get to the same place because I don't have that basis and same with history, you know that the history of where we've been is really important to understanding that we don't repeat or, or to ensure that we're not creating institutions that repeat the same outcomes that tried and failed in the past. So that that education I think is really really critical to you, Heather. Um, maybe you can provide some uh, just a, a highlight for people what those key recommendations that you mentioned were uh, in uh, Mary Ellen Trapella funds in plain sight report. You just just maybe a, a high level of what they encapsulate. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what Joni was saying though first, which was yeah. that I think like when I went into education, I think or when I went back to to do my education, I felt I was an imposter at the tables that I sat at, that I didn't have the knowledge to be sitting there. And I definitely have gained more knowledge and got real smart, but what I bring to that table is not my education. What I bring to the table is what I know. And it's what Joni brings to the table too, which is that what she knows from being in the position that she's at in the community that she's at, which uh, you can't necessarily teach that. Right. So like that's really what you represent when you come to the table. So I think that that's important and it takes some time to recognize that. So the in plain sight report, uh, this is the document. They're all they're all related to health, but I feel like really every part of government could adopt these recommendations and adapt them to whatever it is. So um, I, I won't talk about all 24 recommendations. Um, I'll talk about the ones that I'm specifically working on. Um, so I, I'm working on a lot of the ones right now um, that talk about uh, complaints processes in the in the hospital, like through the hospitals, regional health authorities, the provincial complaints processes, as well as through um, the regulatory bodies. And the reason for that is because like, as we know through the report, many people came forward with um, instances of where they were discriminated against or that there was, they experienced racism. And um, that's really at the point of care, right? And so I would like to like the upstream approach would be to like really change the point of care 
that's going to take, I think, a long time. And I think that that's very important. The complaints process is dealing with people who have already had that experience. And I think that, that why that is so important to me, and it really comes back to my position as a nurse, is I've seen how that impacts people uh, in the future, you know, reluctance to receive care, uh, not receiving care until whatever was their healthcare concern is now a crisis, um, how it impacts generations. So people who have had poor experiences now are, you know, their, their kids are reluctant to go. If they've had a hard time as a child, you know, they will maybe not get the same prenatal care that they would normally, that they would have otherwise gotten. So there's a lot of impacts to that, to those experiences. And I really feel like the, the complaints process is, is an opportunity to rebuild that relationship and that trust. So how can we empower Indigenous people once they've had this experience to, keep, to have their voices heard, as well as to um, sort of shape the change that we need to see, right? How do we hear them and implement what they're saying into the system? So that's just one, like that's one area. There's 24 of these recommendations and they're, they're sort of like put into little subcategories um, based on there's systems, beliefs, and behaviors, and that's how it's looked at. And so really to, to take little bits and pieces of them wouldn't be, although some are long-term, some are short-term, it's really about implementing all 24 of those to see that systemic change. So I really think that I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take out any of them and, and sort of just do them like on their own in silos, but the complaints process is the piece that I'm a part of right now specifically because I really see that there's an opportunity for self-determination and for reconciliation and to empower Indigenous people within the system. So, yeah. Thank you. There's a there's a number of questions here around uh, the traditional forms of governance and then the Indian Act governance. There's some questions about the Indian Act, so maybe I'll I'll just work these questions over a little bit. Um, do either of you want to jump in on on and maybe it's probably best your best suited Jones for this, but uh, the the roles of hereditary chiefs versus uh, elected officials and and yeah, can you do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so hereditary chiefs um, it, that alone has complexity in our communities. Um, they're hereditary chiefs, I guess, in our in our communities would be heads of house, uh, historically. Um, and there are some current uh, hereditary chiefs that are labeled hereditary chiefs that, um, you know, would have been the head of their family, um, historically. And uh, I, you know, we do get pushed at our council table to have representation from all families. Um, but there it's very, very difficult to implement a system like that. Um, uh, one, we have we right now we have a, a elections code that needs a full formal process, and uh, you know that can be really like I, I want to go back to sort of the trust building, right? Like it's there's a there's a lot of mistrust built into our communities, and um, to create a whole new system uh, and move past that is really quite difficult. And within that, there's own family structures. So the way that we live anymore is in tra traditional longhouses where multiple families or multiple units of the same family would live under the same roof. And then there would be very easily a head of a house in that situation. Whereas, you know, the Olson slash Bartleman family that we come from right now uh, has would have multiple heads or if they went with the eldest person would be my dad but often uh, you know at this point in time my uncle Curtis usually will stand up and speak on behalf of the family uh, maybe somewhat begrudgingly to my dad but I mean at the same so implementing like a system that takes into consideration that one head of house um, is very difficult and a lot of uh, nations around British Columbia, to my knowledge, that try and implement systems like that do elders committees and take uh, strategically take elders from uh, different families in the community to make sure that there's representation 
um, uh, in those committees. And uh, the Saanich Leadership Council is attempting to do that. We have uh, an elders committee and a language committee, and we have sort of specialist committees that we work with. Um, Sartlet First Nation is still sort of uh, figuring out how we can do that. Although I do have to say um, there's 10 of us on council and we do have a fairly good representation from families. There's a couple of families missing, um, which we, we, we hear about. Um, and we just need to be really conscious of that until we actually can go through. Um, and it is something that's on our mind, uh, the process of recreating the elections code into something that has uh, those kinds of considerations um, built within our, our system. Um, and a lot of community members not only want elder representation from families, but youth representation also. So, um, you know, how that ends up looking, we'll see. Um, I did an essay on this uh, about a year ago, and there's one other nation in British Columbia that has um, done research and a project on this. And the solution was uh, a, a committee of elders uh, that consulted that uh, chief and council, elected chief and councils would consult with. I'll, I'll just add to this. I think there's, um, thank you for that. And I think that one of the things that is often um, misguided in the comments that I hear about the hereditary systems in particular is that it's an unelected person and it's like a monarchy. And I think what's important is we often focus on the people that are involved. And we've talked a lot in this conversation so far about institutions and setting institutions up to, to, to help us get and achieve the outcomes that we want. And I think that what's really important is that what has evolved in British Columbia is a very, very complex network of governance systems that worked. They worked for the people. And part of the reason why uh, the nations were, um, were had such um, complex art and such complex cultures was because those governance structures worked for those people. And it was the imposition of the Indian Act uh, and the, and the, um, the, uh, making the indigenous governance structures that were here illegal and penal, you know, and pe people were penalized for, for continuing them like the potlatch and the sun dance as examples. Uh, it's that disruption that was intentional uh, that, that helped serve the purpose of those crown governments. And it wasn't that, it wasn't that uh, you focused on the individuals, it's that you looked at the institution that was around it and the role that the hereditary chief played and I can't speak for the nations across the province, but was an important role, uh, both as a figurehead, but then as well as a way to be able to gather the information from the advisors in the community to then make a decision on behalf of the community and with the community. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that there was an intentional disruption with the Indian Act to remove Indigenous governance structures. And when we passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act back in 2019, Part of that was around a part of the, the 46 articles that are part of the UNDRIP talk about Indigenous governance. They talk about the right to self-determination. And now that there's been such a level of disruption that's happened in Indigenous governance structures, you know, the, the ability to just kind of go back and reconstitute them is very challenging, as Joni's pointed out. We're now governing within a crown construct. And so to be able to do that in some nations across the province. Have been very fortunate in that their hereditary chief system wasn't disrupted to the level that other communities, mainly the, the urban communities, were disrupted. And the urban communities were very disrupted because it was very close to the forts. So I think that it's important to, to, to acknowledge that the struggle to reconstitute Indigenous governance or to, to have it be the prominent form of governance within a nation it was is going to be exceptionally challenging and it's going to take time. Joni. I just want to add that um, I think the basis, Adam's right, like the Indian Act really went to take out Indigenous governance structures. And I think that the gov Indigenous governance structures weren't so simple as like the head of the house and they just made all of the decisions. We were very much a consensus uh, decision making uh, society. And part of that was also that there was, a, like a provincial government, a speaker of a house. So not necessarily like the chief or the leader of the family or the head of the family would do the speaking. So there was different roles that, that uh, families would have within. Um, often if you see uh, you know, us do 
you know, work is what we call it when it's uh, decision making or or through through ceremony. You'll see a speaker stand up and talk, and then go back and talk to the head of the family, and then come back and state what the head of the family said, and then go back and talk to the head of the family, and then come back and state what the head of the family said. And it's it's a process. It's not, um, you know. And then the family is standing together and there's discussion and there's consensus building. And just one example is like in the Northern communities where um, Northern Gateway Pipeline was approved by um, some of the elected chiefs and some of the matriarchs in that community just removed the elected chiefs. And I've heard that back East too with um, nations on the East Coast is historically when a leader would behave badly, the women in the community would just remove the leader and replace them with somebody uh, who had, was, was honorable. And, um, you know, there was a very high expectation to be honorable as a leader. So consensus building with the people. And I think that First Nations government systems um, with, uh, you know, building, rebuilding that trust, rebuilding that consensus building model would go a long way in um, looking like a historical uh, governance model. Thanks, Jones. Do you have anything that you'd like to add, Heather, to that or? The next question is lined up for you. Okay, so I'm just going to ask. I'm going to I'm going to frame the next con the next question from Bob uh, to you, just in terms of the relationship in, in the work that you're doing to take a look at how the systems respond to Indigenous people who say things that this happened to me or share their experiences. The government response is really, I think, um, the 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 characterizes the relationship between First Nations and uh, and Crown governments. What do you think the relationship should be and how does it differ from the, what's, practice, what's in practice now? Well, that seems like a Joni question. Um. <laughs> I'm trying to spread it around a little bit here. I mean, I just in terms of, from, from a healthcare perspective then, like how does the system, uh, what do you think the relationship should be in healthcare and, and how would that be different from what you see right now? Well. In BC, the relationship in healthcare is different because we have a governance structure-ish in place with the First Nations Health Authority, um, which has the First Nations Ca Health Council, which is um, which is uh, accountable to the chiefs. So there is a there is a structure in place, um, but I think that it's important that. When I think about those structures, that they are more aligned and more in relationship rather than or a sort of a top-down approach to how we would govern and instead making space for Indigenous leaders to help shape what healthcare looks like. The healthcare system wasn't built for us as Indigenous people, it just wasn't. And so making space for Indigenous leaders to be um, in positions of leadership in the healthcare system to uh, change our change our system so that they so that we sort of level that power between the the government and indigenous people so that they can be self more self determining. I mean, likely Joni will say things about self determination too, but like I think that it's really about how we uh, respect each other's ways of knowing and doing things and make space for them within within the system. So that's how it is in the healthcare system, or that's how it should be within the healthcare system. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, this is what I do. Um, you know, uh, when uh, the sky's the limit, really, uh, when you come from a, a province like British Columbia that has a whole bunch of unsettled uh, land and uh, relationships, um, it's going to be a lot of work. I think that what it looks like to me is the governments right now are trying to, uh, well, the federal government is trying to say, First Nations uh, people need to be self-determining. We don't want the Indian Act anymore. We don't, we, we really were horrible at looking after indigenous people and they were, and um, you guys now need to do it yourself. But doing it ourselves without any system, like the Indian Act system that was put in place is the worst system for self-governing. It was just not built that way. So now it's like, okay, now you need to do all of this work to become self-governing uh, structures. And you need to do it in a really big hurry because we wanna get out as quickly as possible. And then the province comes into play and the province is like, oh, wow, okay. So you being self-government, governments need resources. 
governance needs uh, you know, uh, more than just a set of policies, you need something to actually like sustain yourselves with. And we're right here and we're on this land. And, you know, uh, that's, you know, what government doesn't sustain themselves with a land base or with land resources. And so, uh, you know, we're looking at that sort of push and pull back and forth. Now, if it's, we don't like the, the, the solution of, We'll just give you a pocket of money every year, uh, you know, and it's you know never going to be quite enough to actually be a, a self-sustaining community. Just that has not worked. So what ends up happening is First Nations uh, organizations look for land-based resources, something related to uh, the land in order to be sustaining themselves with, and that is like a huge push and pull back on that system. So Flynn Watrod was right. It, it was looking how do we then like have these uh you know take care of first nations because your your whole relationship was based on land right i was like you are the ministry that we need to be talking to in order to be self-sustaining we need a better relationship with land and resources it needs to be based on consent uh first nations uh are looking for economic development we're looking at development there's obstacles in the way now that's like okay now that we're looking for development and everybody else has developed this land, everything's now agricultural land. And so there's these barriers put into place. Okay, now all of indigenous land needs to be agricultural land or green land or forested land that nobody wants to cut trees on or all of those types of things that now we're just responsible for conservation and conservation doesn't actually give you any kind of resources in the bank to take care of your community. So there needs to be like this relationship building, uh, a little bit of giving up of resources and it's not out of one particular pocket first nations uh you know we are a urbanized community there's no land around here we've sat with the governments for ages on on land there's no land around here it's airport it's uh D, &D it's the observatory it's you know you uh, bc hydro it's 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 you know utilities and stuff that that are needed in the community so we actually look and say, we actually argue that we are landowners. We, our treaty was not a land sale treaty and you have to do a lot of research to actually figure that out because it's been buried in history, but it's not a land sale treaty, which means we should have some jurisdictional rights and we're willing to negotiate what those look like. And we realize that the other side of the road isn't going anywhere either. So we just need to actually look at what the responsible sharing actually looks like. And I know I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but I think that uh, that's why it's a structural change. And um, uh, because it has to do with uh, the government's push and pull of, of resources and where things need to go in order to sustain a healthy indigenous community. And you know what? In the end, that benefits everybody because Indigenous people actually really like spending money in in the economy, also. So, uh, you know, it's it 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 makes the economy go around better and it's equitable. Thanks. So, uh, thank you, Jones. I, I think that um, I think you provide some um, really important context to a few of these other questions here as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna rattle off some of my responses to them, um, and just I think. We are five minutes to the scheduled end. Um, both Heather and I have responded. We can stay till 8.30 if people are interested in sticking around, Joni's good. So if, we'll just keep talking about this stuff until 8.30 and if you can stick around till then, great. And if not, thank you for joining us for the hour that we had scheduled this for. Um, there are some uh, comments here with respect to, uh, 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 Garth asked a question, commentaries in the newspapers mostly seem to equate reconciliation to compensation and punishment for wrongdoing but that does not fit with the definitions that Adam just read for us. Could you comment, please? There's also uh, some comments with respect to two parties enter into negotiation to create agreements. Both parties need the power of veto. If not, the power is not balanced. Um, and so I just want to provide some, some comments to this. I think it's really important to understand that the, that the history of, of British Columbia as a colony and as a colonized place is that uh, Europeans showed up here with the power that they gave themselves to grant non-Christian lands as and, and to claim sovereignty over them. Those are the principles of 
terra nullis and the, or the doctrines of terra nullis and the doctrine of discovery. And because the indigenous people here were not Christians, then therefore they could claim sovereignty over the land. And in 1763, the Royal Proclamation, the, the crown, the English crown's own laws said that that was something that needed, that there was reconciliation that was gonna to need to be required. There's gonna be treaties and negotiations that needed to happen and they didn't follow those own laws. And so when it comes to compensation and punishment for wrongdoing, we either live in a country where the rule of law means something and the laws that we create mean something, or we live in a country where it doesn't. And so I can I recognize that there is some there is there is some consternation around what that means. But when you're talking about cultural, when when we're having reports come to us that talk about cultural genocide as an act that happened, where we where we are dealing with um, these acts that are largely recognized for what they are, then yes, there is going to need to be some punishment for wrongdoing, and yes, there is going to need to be some compensation. But it's less about compensation and more about recognizing than it is recognizing that the goal of the colony was to secure land and resources on behalf of the British crown so they could continue building their navy and, and, and engaging in their international trade. And so uh, what the, the Canadian court systems is determining is that Aboriginal, that there are Aboriginal rights and title over the land. And we have largely undefined what that means. And I think that that's the work that we're dealing with right now. And when we're talking about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, what it says is it says we have to find a pathway forward uh, together. There has to be an ability for Indigenous people to be able to, uh, to be engaged in a process there and at the beginning of the process. There has to be an ability for those Indigenous people who have sovereignty over land to be able to say no and to shape the outcomes. And as Joni was pointing out, there has to be as part of that, some recognition that the crown governments don't just have control over all of the resources all of the time and say over all of the decisions that are being made all alone. And it, it's, come, it, it's, it's, it's become a full circle to us as we're talking about the resources that are needed for healing and the resources that are needed for uh, capital infrastructure, like the building of new longhouses, which are the houses of culture and governance in our communities, and as well, uh, healing centers, that the provincial government owns all of the resources that, or controls all, don't, doesn't own all the resources, they control all the resources. And, and uh, clearly, for Indigenous nations to be going back to the province and to the federal government with cap in hand saying, you know, these are our priorities, we want you to invest in them, and they have to pass some sort of test for the for the crown government to agree is clearly not the situation that it needs that can be uh, going forward. And it doesn't. I, I don't think that it that it represents a reconciliation of the the what the Canadian court system is saying to us, and that is that there isn't a single sovereign. There are multiple sovereigns over the land, and that it's going to require these institutions that we've been talking about to find a new way to, to recognize that and to have it, uh, ha and to breathe life into it uh, in our governance structures. And so um, there's nothing easy about this conversation going forward, but there's nothing easy about the conversation of the past either. And that's the reason why our Crown governments have done everything they can to cover them up and run from it. Joni, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to like add a little bit more context to that. So when we sit down with the federal government, they say their number one goal is to help close the socioeconomic gap uh, between uh, First Nations communities and non First Nations communities. And um, the first thing on our list to talk about is fisheries. We were ocean going people. That's why we have such small on land uh, base communities um, uh, or reserves. That was the that was the justification of our reserve size. And um, so we were being ocean going people, the, the sockeye salmon was our economy, a huge portion of our economy. And when we look today at what happened has to, to the sockeye salmon, we, our community can't get any sockeye salmon. Uh, we're now, you know, talking to the government, you know, we need to talk conservation around uh, salmon. And uh, we have a, a right within our, uh, the Douglas Treaty that says, you have a right to fish as formerly. 
And to fish as formerly within the uh, Sanish and Bay Bermuda case actually meant that you don't just have the right to fish as formerly, you have the right to the location of the fishery and the travel to and from the fishery and the care of the fishery. That's what to fish as formerly meant in the Sanish and Bay Marina case. So when you talk about looking at closing the socioeconomic gap, we want to focus on fisheries because that was our economy. Let's talk about that. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you put a new of what little fishery there is, the dredging out of the Fraser River or uh, the um, creation of uh, the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 expansion project. These projects that are, uh, you know, we were, we, that we fished the Fraser River. We, uh, and we um, reef netted between here and the, down into the San Juan Islands and I mean, all throughout the Salish Sea. And so when we talk about um, conservation, one, we do talk about compensation because I forget the old guy's name that owns all the whole fishery on the West Coast. Adam might be able to help me, but he's walked away with billions of dollars of our economy. And so there is an element of compensation there. And that is not, you know, that may be an individual. And that's how the government kind of washes their hands of it. Oh, the, well, the government didn't make that money. Uh, the guy who owns the car factories, own, whatever his name is. Sorry, I drew a blank on his name. Jimmy Patterson. Yeah, Patterson, you know, and so that's the way we wash our hands of it is, thanks Emily, Jim Patterson. Um, that's the way the government Join. hand it over to them. And then, and then there's no government responsibility to it. But the government essentially has made those decisions. And um, so we go to the federal government and say, uh, just in one situation, uh, let's look at how we can move forward with fisheries, but let's actually look at the loss of our economy and what that looks like because it was actually in a treaty relationship, which is a legal right. And Adam covered a little bit of that to begin with. Thanks, Jones. And I think that's really important context. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this over to, to Heather. I asked a question in budget estimates in the Ministry of Health around the role that indigenous, basically around the role that indigenous people are playing in implementing the in plain sight. Whose responsibility is it? You know, and, and I, I respect the fact that the minister moved quickly to create uh, an office that then uh, addresses this, but then, you know, is it, is the weight of that work that needs to be done in, in kind of, um, removing the systemic racism from our healthcare system, should that be the, on the weight of indigenous people alone? Or So the, the question here uh, that, yeah, sorry, I just want to make sure that I've got it. There's a question here uh, from somebody just with respect to um, all of the work of reconciliation should be the ba on the backs of non-indigenous people. What are your thoughts? And, and just asking, what is the role you think of, of indigenous people in this and non-indigenous people in reconciliation? Have yeah, and to Joni's Joni's question, and I don't have a lot to add to it, but but I think it's also about looking at it equity, right? So if we if we look at it through an equity lens, then then when we look at reconciliation, and it's to Joni's point earlier too, is that some of that will mean that there's some uh, people need to in order for people to get to a place where they can be self-determining or communities to be able to be thriving. It takes some capacity building. So um, that's a good question. And I think um, I appreciate the comment. I do, because I, I think that I that that there it is important that non-Indigenous people um, understand their role in changing systems. I think that it, it, it needs to be collaborative it's, and it needs to be in partnership because I, I don't know how we change the system without it involving and partnering with Indigenous people and have that not be recolonizing. So I think that it's important that we are hearing what Indigenous people say and allow Indigenous people to lead when they can and when, but I think that um, and I think that with, but within our ministry, Ministry of Health, or I guess within government, and this was what Adam was saying, you know, um, during estimates, 
is that there's room for all of us. Like we, it shouldn't just be the Ministry of Health that accepts in the recommendations of the Implant Site Report. It shouldn't just be the Ministry of Health that apologizes for racism in our in our healthcare system. Maybe the healthcare system, but what about our other systems? So how are we ensuring that our our government is taking responsibility and and leading in change and doing that? with Indigenous leaders. And so that's one of the recommendations in the report is to ensure that there's Indigenous leaders that at, in, in leadership positions within each health authority, but also um, we have an Associate Deputy Minister who's Indigenous, right? So ensuring that there's people in these, in these systems that are helping to lead the way. So I think that it really is, um, you know, but then I, I have a lot of conversations around like, we don't wanna let the ministry off the hook. It is their job to fix racism in the healthcare system. Like we do want people to be accountable for change. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that indigenous people are heard and that they that they also have a space to to help lead that change. So yeah. I can't I can't speak to how much improved the relationship between Central Sandwiches and Sartlip for an example, but I can tell you that I know for a fact that it changed when I was sitting at the Central Sandwich table and Joni was sitting at the startup table. And one of the ways that I know that it changed was because at the end of those meetings, I'd come home from council, and Joni would come home from council, and we'd have a conversation about the work that we were doing. And that conversation had never happened in the history of, of the district before, of, of municipal politics. And so at the very least, what I can confirm is that while the, the relationship might not be dramatically advanced, it is dramatically different. And there is a different relationship there now than there was before. And, and so it speaks to your point that you made, Heather, with respect to having Indigenous people at the table, having an elected Indigenous people. I can tell you that from the role that I'm in, there's three of us. And I feel a, a huge amount of responsibility for the whole conversation because I have a special ability to stand up and say things at times that other people don't. And so getting it right is important. It's a burden to, to carry to get it right. Because, you know, I, I use the example, I felt like I was at the, standing at the top of a ladder and the apple was still six feet above my head and how precarious that position felt because you're vulnerable to everybody on all sides. But what I'd say is I can confirm to you that the decision-making is better when there are, is a reflection of the diversity in our bureaucracy, in all of our institutions, at all of our decision-making tables, and everywhere through government. And where there is a lack of diversity in that situation, you end up having these, these corners that, that where cobwebs can collect because, because there's a lack of awareness and there's a lack of presence at those tables. Jones? Yeah, I agree. And I just wanna say that, um... The people at the other, like Indigenous people come to the table and we spend a lot of time educating mm. uh, the other side of the table. And frankly, it is exhausting. And it, um, it, it takes up a lot of time at those tables and it, it kind of wastes time at those tables. And then uh, bureaucracy often will like switch, you know, like whether it be a an election and everything shuts down and there's no conversation or whether it be the change of an administrative role and then that the next person comes in and frankly I, I feel like it's a government tactic at times but I feel like one thing that uh, the other side can do whether it be the people who are actually at those no negotiating tables or just general society is to really like do some work in educating yourselves so that it's not just you know, when you get to those tables and saying, oh, so I'm so thankful for you sharing that information with me. And then, you know, it, uh, you know, I'm thinking you, you've been put at this negotiating table to negotiate with the Wasanich people and you have done zero research into who the Wasanich people are. Like we are starting at ground zero. Two books that I recommend uh, are An Inconvenient Indian followed by Unsettling Canada they uh, give you a very good perspective of uh, indigenous uh, advocacy of ourselves over the last 150 years, because a lot of people think, oh, this is kind of new, like we're just kind of hearing now, uh, you know, indigenous people are just starting this sort of uh, uprising and fight for it. And you can see uh, in the history that isn't told in our classrooms that indigenous people in fact have been saying these things 
for a very long time and have been working underground on paper, red, the red paper, the brown paper for a very long time, getting ourselves into the constitution, into section 35 for a very long time um, within a, an extremely oppressive system. So just doing some reading, summertime, uh, there's a ton of books out there um, and that's, that creates a better starting place uh, for those conversations. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to the education system because there was a question that was asked about it, but I'm just going to answer this um, question to me. Uh, we agree um, that you be prepared to, will, will I have criticized the BC and federal Liberal Party for their limited intent to condemn the churches and the RCMP? And so I, I think that what's really important is that, uh, is that people know that I've had a, uh, a meeting with uh, the Catholic, the head of the Catholic Church here in the big, Victoria Diocese, I'll continue to meet with the churches. They absolutely need to be held accountable for the role that they played in the residential schools. Uh, this was crown policy. It was Indian Act policy. Your elected officials of the past passed legislation that required this, but the churches were all too happy to deliver the crown policy and they did. And they did a, they did a deplorable job and they need to be held accountable for it. Uh, am I gonna hold other political parties of, um, accountable? Uh, sure, I guess my role is to hold other political parties accountable. Although what I will say is that the most important statement is, is that the churches are responsible for what they have done in the past and need to take responsibility for it. And they need to show that in their actions. And whether other political parties say that same thing or not, uh, I, I, I don't have any control over that. Although I think it's really important that as indigenous leaders, we are setting a strong um, tone for others to follow. And uh, hopefully they, uh, we'll get there. We haven't discussed the role of education in exposing and eradicating systemic racism. What are your thoughts? And we, we started this conversation with the with your education and 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 how you've got to where you're at. Any comments on the education system and and um, recognizing we've got about 15 minutes left and a few more questions. So maybe we'll go to the rapid fire round. Any comments on education? Either either one of you. I could start. Joni, go. You're Mike's I, I get asked to go in and talk to high school classrooms on uh, Indigenous rights or governance or storytelling or whatnot because there just isn't that, uh, there isn't a ton of uh, curriculum out there and teachers now like, uh, you know, have this, you know, there's this push for curriculum, but there's not really a lot of substance there for them to be choosing from. So they choose guest speakers and um, there absolutely is a need. Uh, you know, if you going through the education system and I had an argument with a couple of my political science teachers about, uh, you know, the belief systems that he was teaching around political science, like political science 201, indigenous people's relationship with Canada, unit 10 out of 12. We spent half an hour on it and it was because there isn't really a big relationship between Canada's politics and indigenous politics. And I am like, what are you kidding me? Like there is, and then of course you take indigenous studies or um, indigenous history and it's all political, all of it's political. And so I think that Canada has a lot to, you know, I think that curriculum is difficult because society changes faster than our systems do. And I don't think that we've updated our curriculum and I, we do it very slowly um, and carefully. And I get that uh, I have got children and in schools, but they're also really critical thinkers and can handle a lot of information and love thinking about those things and talking about those things and debating on them. Like my 15 year old loves a good debate about things. So I, I think that we underestimate our children and I think that we need to ramp up uh, indigenous education uh, within our public school systems and tell the truth about it, be very truthful about it because I think that our world is a crazy place and our teenagers and our children are handling so much pressure. And then we're like, oh, well, we don't wanna tell them the truth about this, but they can handle everything else that's being thrown at them. And I think they want the truth. I don't think kids like being lied to. And I want to say also that it would be really good to have um, equal uh, education funding for Indigenous children, which is a huge issue and um, a little bit more um, uh, authority over creating our own curriculums within our tribal school. Uh, they do some really great land-based learning and um, that we still don't have a uh, full uh, jurisdiction over uh, our own education. So uh, a couple of other plugs there, thanks. Heather, anything to add? 
I love going after Joni because I can just sort of wrap up and be like, yeah, everything she said, I agree with. Um, yeah, a couple more thoughts as somebody that's gone through education. So like less, so like the, you know, K to 12 system, but through our, you know, university systems is that they continue like through the healthcare system, at least that's the, that's the, is that um, they also don't well represent Indigenous people uh, within within those programs. They're they're really they they don't have Indigenous teachers. They don't uh, speak about you know health disparity from a from a Indigenous lens lens. They don't um, provide a ton of placements in Indigenous communities where they can actually build relationships. It does happen, and Startlip always takes as many students as we can because we see that as a valuable experience of coming in and really understanding and like immersing themselves in the health center to ensure that they have a good understanding. But I also think that like the education system itself isn't always a safe space for indigenous people either. So I think that again, to Joni's point, there's a lot of, for, for the learners doing a lot of teaching in those, in those systems. And so they aren't always places that are well represented by indigenous people. There's, there needs to be some like cultural safety learning, there needs to be some anti-racism learning. There need like their teachers should it should be a it should be a requirement of teachers in in higher education learning that they have a, a good understanding of that. Especially, I'll just speak specifically to BC or Canada. Like there's an Indigenous population here, and if we're teaching about health in in Canada, then we should have a good understanding of what that means for our Indigenous population. Um, and um, there is a rec in the In Plain Sight report that, that talks about what that can look like. It's recommendation 18. And it talks about how we can um, uh, make changes to our, our health um, education in, in higher in universities and colleges. And so you can Google it and look it up, but I think it's really important that we, we examine our systems and examine what we're teaching and ensure that we are actually teaching what our learners need to learn. To Joni's point as well. So. Yeah, I think um, I think to the point that was made and and I uh, Joni made around um, society moving much quicker. And I think that this is about the this is about the institutions. We talk about education. We talk about healthcare. We talk about all of the other ministries and government institutions that have been established, and recognize that. Society is moving and evolving. I opened this by talking about I don't know more and Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act. A lot has happened in the last decade and a half uh, on this issue. And society has moved at a much, and I, you know, even though I'd say society on a whole, and, and, I'm, and I'm being cautious here because we're we're not as far as we'd like we, us to be and we're not as far as we need to be and we're not anywhere near that but what i'll say is we're a lot further than we were 15 years ago that's a fair statement and i think that it's important to recognize that the slowest moving aspects of our society are our government structures they're the ones that are holding on the tightest to the status quo they're the ones that are saying the nice words and not doing the meaningful actions they're the ones that are promising to have litigation uh, declarations to tell people in the lawyers to stop fighting indigenous title and making them prove it. And yet they're fighting indigenous title and making us prove it. And so they I think- So they do this though, Adam, for their constituents. Like let's get down to the basis of it. They do it because they don't wanna not be elected the next time. That's the basis of, of why politicians do what they do. Uh, whether it's good policy advice that they're, rarely policy advice that they're getting. It's all on what they're gonna be voted in. And as long as there's a major portion of society that still hold like, can't, is afraid of that change, is afraid of First Nations people, is uneducated on it, and you know will be angry if there's any sort of push towards other, um, then that's the way that uh, the system will always be. You're absolutely right. And you know what, there is way too many questions for us to get to in the next 10 minutes. Uh, and I, I just really want, like, I think it's really important to, to, to highlight that uh, just the number of questions that we've had, I've been trying to keep up with them. We've answered 16 questions. Some of them I've typed an answer for. We've still got 18 questions. They're, they're coming. And I think what this is an indication of is just how much people want to know and, and how much people want to engage this conversation. I find it 
very encouraging. And what I hope that you all take is that just, if we don't answer your questions tonight, don't stop pursuing the answers because there are really, really important questions that are being asked here around Indigenous governance, around how do we achieve uh, this, the, the multiple sovereign scenario. And I think that it's, a, it's not as uh, difficult as perhaps governments have been making it out to be. We have multiple sovereigns already in this country. The federal and provincial governments are examples of that and they figure out ways to work with each other. So this is not an impossible task. It is very possible by motivated people. And so to Joni's point, and I think to the question at the very top, the first question that came in about how to be allies, Joni's point is the one that is must really resonate here amongst all the other things that we said. Politicians, there's two of them in this room tonight, are motivated by their voters. The currency of politics is votes. And it's really important for people who are passionate about this to be contacting their MLAs, their MPs, their local governments, their local First Nations, and saying that they support this work and that this work is important to them and this import work is important to you and your family in the future, that, that governments seize themselves of this and do the important, difficult work that's ahead. That is the only way that we're going to be able to get the social movement that's happening right now in our country to resonate and land in actions with government and the institutions that we're talking about. One question here, and I know that we're Canada Day is two days away, and we're just at the end of National Indig Indigenous History Month, and we're a week past National Indigenous Celebration Day or whatever it's called this year. It'd be called something different next year, so don't memorize it. But anyway, and that's my cynical statement about National Aboriginal Indigenous Day. Anyway, um, what do people? Do, what do you, what's your? What are your thoughts on what people should do for this Canada Day? Is this a and just in just uh, just off the cuff? I'm gonna go to you, Heather. I'm gonna go back to your question about. I keep doing this, so I'm sorry, but I think that, and I'm the non-politician in the room, so this is gonna sound super naive, but like I agree that you know, we need constituents to talk about how important this work is, but we have things like the truth and reconciliation, right? Like we have things that give us call to action. We have the Implant Site Report that talks about in racism in the healthcare system. Like, and so I feel like it should just be a standard. Like if every, if every political party just had it as a standard that we actually will, you know, take the Declaration Act seriously and, and are committed to uh, the Truth and Reconciliation and the In Plain Sight Report, like that these shouldn't be areas where you are voted for, like for or not, they just that all parties actually are committed to this. Because otherwise, like if we're just like, which party is going to take racism seriously or which one we don't agree with these. So we're gonna vote for the one that doesn't take it as seriously then like, this is how it's entrenched in the system, right? And so I feel like it should just be a, an expectation and we shouldn't be using it. Totally. In, it our, creates, our, in our camp. Yeah, it creates a lot of instability, yeah. what it does. Yeah. So for Canada Day, I, I mean, I probably have my own feelings about what should happen with flags and that kind of thing, but I feel like, um, I'm not going to be celebrating Canada Day. I'm going to be hanging out with my kids, and uh, that's how I'll spend it. And um, that's it. Yeah. Jones? I've never celebrated Canada Day. Uh, maybe as a teenager when it was all about the drinks, and uh, I actually don't like drinking very much at all. Uh, uh, we could go off about that for a while, but um, I. Uh, I also have, over the last few years, have spent it um, kind of bitter, to be honest. I sit at home and wonder why I'm not feeling so great um, and refuse to go to my sister-in-law's uh, Canada Day party. And maybe that's why I'm not feeling so great. Um, and I, there's a lot of things um, shut down this year and a lot of celebrations not happening. She canceled her Canada Day party this year. So I maybe will feel a bit better um, to be honest, if people are wondering if it matters that there's no Canada Day in some places, it, it actually does make me feel a bit better. Um, 
So I, I don't, I have never celebrated Canada. Um, I feel like uh, it's been a really oppressive state to Indigenous people. I don't just feel that, I know that. And I also know that, um, you know, that's a difficult thing to celebrate for me. And uh, there is a lot of beautiful things about Canada that I really, really love, like its geography, um, the ocean and the desert and the trees. And I will celebrate Canada by, uh, you know, being part of that and um, with uh, my family also. So um, hopefully one day I will feel really good about celebrating Canada. And um, I hope that's in my lifetime because um, it's difficult not to. Uh, it takes a lot out of me not to celebrate Canada, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a conscious decision I've made. So thank you. If we can, this morning I was on. If we're going to celebrate it, which I mean, I'm with you, Joni. But if we are, can we do it so with, with some humility? Mm -hmm. You know. So this morning I was on CBC I do the CBC political panel on Monday mornings, and you know I said that for me this year and and like Canada Today is actually for for me most years is a day of reflection. As an MLA, I have this role that I that I have to play and or that I do play as as a the provincial representative of this area and do the Sydney parade and do the pancake breakfast and do the boat tour of the Southern Gulf Islands, and and the, that last part is actually the part that Joni was talking about and and just being out on the water in our traditional territories is is, uh, is I think a cleansing a purification of all the stuff that I do in the morning, which is the parade. But I can say that you know I think. For me, Canada Day has been a time of reflection. It's a time that I reflect on, uh, on, on who we are and where we've come from. And I, I actually think that Canada Day is a lot more about celebrating the institutions that we've spent the last hour and a half talking about deconstructing and reconstructing. And there's, there's, there is not much to celebrate in terms of these institutions. These institutions haven't been good to nature. They haven't been good to indigenous people. In fact, they haven't been good to poor people and a lot of other people and they, they've really served one type of person and, and, uh, and, and not the beautiful diversity of this country. They, do, it doesn't, they don't serve new immigrants to this country well. Uh, you, can, you, you can see uh, new immigrants to this country who've got incredible educations doing menial work because we don't trust them and we don't trust the institutions in their country. So, so I think that it is an opportunity for us to reflect on who we are and who we wanna be, and then start to draw lines between who we are and, and who we wanna be, and find yourself on a journey on one of those lines on how you can help us, uh, and I say us collectively, get to that better place, to that better, to that better um, society. And I think that we are moving in that direction. And now we need to be encouraging our, our government officials to be moving in that direction and to, to be speaking honestly about uh, who we are and, and where we're going. So uh, unless there's anything else, I, I have to, I do have to apologize to all of the people whose questions that we didn't answer. And I'll just leave it at this. Joni, we've had someone, uh, Joni and Heather, we've had someone recommend that this be part one of a series. Do you want to come back and do this again sometime and, and continue this conversation? And, if people find it valuable, would you be available to have a second conversation about this? Yeah, but I want to do it with like us all having our mics on at the same time. And okay, just, and we'll just all talk at the same time then? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's good. good old have, and I'm sure people will find a lot of value in that. Like That's how we usually do it. That's right. Um, we welcome yeah. people into our, into our uh, summer cookout. Yeah, I would be totally interested in doing this again. Um, I've actually been sitting with our dad's church group for the last eight months, every second Sunday, um, doing the same thing. So this is something that I enjoy doing. Um, I, I uh, uh, feel like um, this is probably uh, one of the more cordial conversations that we've had as siblings and the longest. So I want to thank you guys for recommending that we actually live very close together, but we're very busy people. And um, usually Adam leaves dinner early because he uh, ate too much and needs to lie on the couch. And our conversations get set <laughs> short because Heather's also chasing children and uh, needs to put them in bed. So 
Um, this is pro this is probably the longest conversation um, I've had, and I like the prompting of the questions because then there's something to work with. So thank you all for coming and listening. And if they book me again, I'll be here. Okay, we'll be booked. We'll do it again. We've got a bunch of questions. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to capture them all. Maybe Robert can do that. Thank you to BC Greens. Thank you, Robert Routledge, for uh, facilitating and, and being our, our host behind the dark screen this evening. I really appreciate you putting this together. We will do this again. Thank you, Heather, for bringing your wisdom and experience, your knowledge, your incredible knowledge, as you are the director of all knowledge, of, apparently, of the provincial government. And Joni, I really uh, thank you for bringing your wisdom and experience uh, to this as well. And if I added any value, then that was completely by accident. So uh, for somebody thank who you. spoke about humility, I really am loving that title. Yeah, that's right. exactly. exactly. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening on this very, very hot summer, summer's day. Continue to stay cool and uh, we, you'll hear from us again. I'm pretty sure that, uh, that we will uh, have part two of this conversation with a whole new fresh round of, of uh, questions. And thank you all for your contributions this evening. Have a wonderful one. Take care. Hi, Equal.